Thank you. Um, Sally can't be with us today, so it's uh, Paul and I that will take you through this research. And there's a fourth researcher as well who's not even mentioned on the PowerPoint who took uh, part in the research as well, Ulf Hansen, who's teaching in Sweden at the moment, so he's not here either. So Paul and I will take you through what we've done. As you can see from the title, it's to do with uh, GPS tracking, looking at how we can use GPS tracking to deliver models of where young people move and why they move and how they move a little bit as well, but largely where they move, their personal geographies and what sort of patterns those make uh, as they navigate the landscape. So if the technology works for me here. The context of it is, of course, we're living in a divided society. Uh, many of the young people, most of the young people will live in segregated areas. They very often go to schools where they're dominated by one particular community. And that's where really we were coming from uh, for much of this research. And for many of them, there's sectarianism. Uh, there are places where they feel safe, perhaps only in their own communities. There will be areas where they feel far from safe. And this may impact upon where they move uh, and where they travel. And indeed, there's some research to suggest that it might actually impact on their uh, life choices and limit their life choices if they're constrained in those movements. The context as well, when you're looking at divided societies, the, the temptation is to do Belfast, because there the divisions are writ large. And we deliberately avoided doing Belfast. Uh, we did instead uh, an ordinary provincial town, Coleraine. But despite the fact that it's not Belfast, despite the fact that it doesn't have the big divisions that you can see in Belfast, the divisions are still there. It's still a mixed uh, community, but with divisions within it. Uh, you can see... Oops. Not peace walls, not enormous murals on every gable or whatever. There are a few, but you can still see nuances of division. You can still find painted curbstones and uh, street furniture. You can find flags and emblems uh, in various different parts of Coleraine as you move about, which are very familiar to the people that live there, but even those that are visiting the town can see the differences. So there are still those divisions, even though it's, a, in other words, an, an unremarkable town in many ways. The study itself, we uh, took four post-primary schools, 74 young people in all from those four post-primary schools. We worked through the geography departments that we knew, and it was a geography class in each instance. Uh, three bits to the research. They did a, a biographical questionnaire to start off with, and at the end we came back and we did a focus group and we showed them some of the results, and we talked to them about it and got them to tell us about what they felt about the results. But the main bit of the the research was them um, carrying tracking devices for a full week. Uh, there's one shown in the photograph here. Uh, this girl's wearing it in her wrist. Many of them put it around their neck with a lanyard. Many of them just slipped it into a pocket and carried it for a week. And those tracking devices plotted where they were every five seconds during the time that they were wearing those devices. Uh, outside doesn't work so well if you're inside. And that gave us a wealth of data from those 74 uh, individuals over a week. The breakdown of the 74 individuals in terms of age, mostly 15-year-old. It was one class that was slightly older. Nice balance between males and females. And in terms of uh, what community they came from, so that was one of the questions that we asked in their biographical questionnaire, uh, it was almost exactly the same as the census has for Coleraine. So from that point of view, fairly representative of the Coleraine population. And that allowed us, when we knew all of that information, to start mapping this. Now, I put up a couple of maps just to show you the sorts of things that we can do, because once all of that data is in, you can break it down whatever way you want. You can compare males and females, slightly older young people to slightly younger young people, or here, as here, where we have done it by time of day. So this is everybody in the survey zoomed into cold rain, uh, and this is between 6 in the morning and 5.59 in the evening time. And if you know cold rain, that's the, the roundabout on the way in. That's the, the, uh, the hospital the bypass, one up to Port Rush, the new bridge, the old bridge, the town centre. So you can orient yourself. And little clusters of where most of the movement was and empty areas where the people did not go during the day in, in uh, the week-long data-gathering exercise. Some of those clusters are schools, some of them are shopping centres, some of them are other, other outlets that people are using. And if you contrast that with the nighttime pattern, you see it's different. So there's less movement at night, and they're also going to different places. So it was on the basis of being able to divide up the data like that and being able to zoom into certain areas and ask questions of it that we were able to, to do what we were doing. And Paul will take you into 
uh, some of the other ways we can cut up this data uh, later on. What we were more interested in when we started this was the community divide type of thing. Were there different geographies for the different communities that lived in Coleraine? And here are a couple of maps. Uh, the Heights is a, a part of Coleraine that some of you might know on the west bank of the Ban. Uh, it's got uh, a, a, probably a, a predominantly Catholic population, certainly parts of it up here would be predominantly Catholic. And you can see the breakdown between Protestant and Catholic maps are very different. There are different movements in these uh, young people in terms of where they go and where they don't go. And there are some areas of the heights that Protestants do not go, and some areas of the heights a little further out that Catholics do not uh, tend to go into as well, and other areas which appear to be more mixed. So it did appear from this that there were these sorts of divisions that were happening between communities. When we went back to the schools, the four different schools, and we sat down with the groups that had done this, and we showed them maps like this and asked them about it and asked whether it was reflective of what they thought about their geography, they showed very well that they knew exactly what the ethnic geography of their particular settlement was like. They knew exactly which areas they felt safe in, which areas they felt uncomfortable in, which areas they would avoid at all costs. So they understood very well how Coleraine was split up and knew exactly how to navigate the complexities of the ethnic geography of even a, simple, a simply divided uh, settlement like Coleraine and places where they avoid, as you see. The second set of maps shows much the same thing, but perhaps even more starkly demonstrated. Um, this is the Balisali estate to the north of Coleraine, and you can see here that this is entirely dominated by one particular group that appear to use this estate. And in the whole week that, the, that we were running this exercise, only one person who self-identified as Catholic actually entered this estate. And you can see the movement here, entering from the south, lingering a little while, and then disappearing uh, out of another exit from the estate. And that was the only instance of an individual who had identified as Catholic going into that estate. Now that shows that the geography of Coleraine is fundamentally divided, and people will uh, use particular areas, avoid particular areas, according to their perception of whether they belong in them, they don't belong in them, whether they're comfortable in, in them or not. And just as with the last slide, when we went back to focus groups, they talked quite openly about this. But one interesting thing that they brought up was the fact that, actually, in a way, they're more vulnerable than we would be in such circumstances, because we can go into these housing areas um, incognito, in civvies, as it were. They're wearing school uniform very often, which is a perception of what kind of community they belong to very often. And very often, then, that makes it a much more difficult for them to navigate these complex ethnic uh, interfaces than it would be for, for people who are not so easily identified as belonging to one community or another. So they knew very well which areas that they felt safe in and which areas they did not. This is my last image, and then there's one more slide, and then Paul can take over. This is the centre of Coleraine. I'm not sure if you can see this, but we both uh, Protestants and Catholics put in here. Uh, the choice of colours of orange and green is entirely accidental. Uh, but put together, you might think that the centre of Coleraine actually is mixed. Both communities are there together. The town hall is here, by the way. Oops. Where are we? Town hall. The road going down to the river, which is just off there. It's a Dunn store car park, if you're familiar with Coleraine. But both communities are in there. And they're in there together at the same time very often. When we asked them afterwards, one of the things that they said they did, these 15-year-olds in particular, is that they go up the town for coffee, particularly on a Friday afternoon. And they go up the town, whether they be Catholics or whether they be Protestants. You might think this is perhaps an indication that this is shared space. But actually, when we questioned them more closely and when we looked more closely at the data, actually, this isn't necessarily shared space. They are using the same space. They are going into the centre of town at the same time, but they're doing it separately in their own communities. And we thought that this really, rather than shared space, this might be more accurately defined as co-use space. They're using it, using it at the same time, but they're not using it together. They're not using it in any sort of shared fashion. And finally, maybe a, a, a more encouraging bit. Coleraine is quite a small place 
it's not large enough like Belfast to have large monolithic areas that can have their own services. So uh, Belfast could have a shopping centre which is predominantly used by one community and one up the road which is predominantly used by the other one. Or a swimming pool, a sports centre, a park that is a Catholic park and a Protestant park. Coleraine isn't big enough for that. So in a way that's reassuring because there are uh, limited services in Coleraine which have to be shared. And some of the young people recognise that. So for example there is one cinema and while maybe the earlier images wouldn't encourage us to be too hopeful about it. The chances are that the communities could meet here, could uh, come into contact here, and could share in some sort of meaningful way. That was what we set out to do, this ethnic geography, Catholic Protestant thing. That's what we set out to study with this. This is why we equipped the schools with the devices that we did. That's why we selected the schools that we did. It's what we've written up. It's what we've uh, produced a paper on and so forth. But actually, some of the other things that came out of the study were potentially uh, more illuminating than that and more interesting. And that's what Paul is going to do now. So then, just to, to develop from that, what we did with some of this, with the data, was compare it then with uh, deprivation status in Coleraine. So for this, we basically were able to take the household where the person was from, and we were able to take that and look up their range of movement over the course of, of a week. Um, so if you see on the, on the left-hand picture, there's the multiple deprivation measure, and they're divided into two classes, one and two. That would be typically a more deprived area. Uh, and on this side, we've got nine and ten, which we've classified to be more affluent areas. So you can see from using this um, map, we've essentially got a, a fairly restrained range of movement in more deprived areas. Whereas if we look at more affluent areas, children from those areas tend to travel a lot more um, than people from more deprived backgrounds. So by taking this deprivation data, we were able to look at a whole range of different trends with that information by linking movement with their deprivation status as well. Um, I think I drew the short straw whenever it came to this table, so bear with me. Um, it is, it's very useful whenever we look at what we've got. This is only for Korean residents, nothing else. So if somebody was from another area, they were taken out of the data set and we only looked at people from Korean. And we only looked at people at the weekend, so we took out all weekday information. And you can see on the left-hand side, we've got um, a quintile. So again, as the, the axis represents, we've got one which is pretty much the most deprived areas uh, on, the, on the scale. And then going up to five, which we've classified as the least deprived or the more affluent areas. Now, if you look at the data, typically what we have seen from this is that the range of movement... Um, you can see here, generally increases the more affluence that we see within the people uh, in our sample. So a child from a deprived background, they typically travelled less. If they were from a more affluent area, they typically travelled more. Um, we can also see here that the range or the maximum distance that was travelled also increased, generally speaking, in a linear pattern. So again, the more affluent you were, the more range of travel you generally had within that data set as well. On the less affluent, the more deprived areas typically had more curtailed ranges of movement in that data set as well. Um, and also the speed, we were able to look at the GPS and because we knew where everybody was every five or 30 seconds, we were able to look at how quickly they went from one point to the other so we could work out the speed at which they were travelling. And again, the representation is that whenever they are in a more deprived area, the speed is slower, so walking or whatever. Whenever you're in a more affluent area, the speed of travel tends to increase. So again, public transport or private transport. You can see here as well that all these trends, uh, or these two trends here, are significant, um, which gives us a, a statistical proof that there is a relationship between affluence or deprivation and the, uh, the amount travelled and the speed travelled. The column here at the end shows a very, very strong relationship um, between deprivation status and the areas in which people travel. So basically, um, whenever we looked at this data here, we were able to say that if somebody was living in a deprived area, they typically stayed in that deprived area and didn't travel very far. So they were staying in their areas or staying in similar areas over the course of the weekend. People that were in less deprived, more affluent areas typically also spent more time in similarly affluent areas 
they crossed boundaries a lot more because they were travelling further. But generally speaking, they were also staying in areas that had higher affluence uh, than other, other kids. Uh, and you can see the relationship there is very, very strong indeed. Um, and just going on to the next one here. So the main messages from that are that least deprived, the more affluent areas, have a greater range of travel. They tend to travel by vehicle much more, whether it's private or public transport, and they move through less deprived areas. So these children, generally speaking, just stay within their, their affluent areas. Uh, most deprived areas have a restricted range of travel, appear to have much less access to vehicles and tend to travel through more deprived areas as well. So they're staying within their, their uh, areas that are similar to them. Um, we took a look then at a circle to represent the range of movement. Uh, a circle is not a, a perfect way to represent this. But if we looked at a deprived area, they had essentially a range of movement, maybe about 23 kilometres squared. If we took that to a less deprived um, pupil in the, in the range, you can see that their range is much, much higher. So that's just a very crude measure. It's, it's far from robust statistically, but it was just representing that essentially if you were from an affluent area, an affluent school, you had a much greater range of movement than somebody from a, a more deprived area. Um, so there were some very, very interesting trends in there that, that were coming through in the data. Um, so then the questions really come on from that are, so what? How does this impact on anything uh, that, we're, that we are interested in? Well, deprivation and conflict obviously has a big impact on this. Uh, and we've seen that typically segregated communities, more deprived areas, have more conflict uh, associated with them. So widespread agreement that poverty, underdevelopment and high levels of inequality are all high risk for armed conflict. So by these children having very limited movements, they're unable to break away from those areas and there's a higher propensity for conflict in those areas as well. Um, but again, this is fairly small sample size at the minute, but there's potentials there to increase this and look at other areas and see if the the statistics still hold. The other one is mobility. We can see here that uh, for middle class, they look at travel as a way to develop their horizons, look at opportunities going for sport or whatever. So they see travel as a means to develop a richer lifestyle, whereas more deprived areas typically stay within an area and are more constrained uh, by those areas. They don't look at outside as an opportunity to learn. Uh, they're mo more looking at staying inside as an area of safety within those areas too. Um, and the last one that we have here is academic achievement, particularly for male Protestants um, in depraved areas. There's a very strong link between male Protestant young men um, and having lower attainment levels, and that's also linked to these, these ranges of movement, so they don't travel far, and that also seems to have an impact then on that academic achievement whereas the other ones that are more affluent have wider ranges of movement and also have higher academic achievement within that as well. Um, so then just to finish up, um, there's lots of different ways that we would like to do this. Um, I think for us, the, the big questions at the minute are really looking at physical and mental health to see if any links are there between deprived uh, status or a more affluent status and health uh, reported from children. And also looking then at maybe BMI or obesity or whatever in the, in the community as well. So there's lots of different ways that we would like to take the research. Um, but on a sample of 70 from a fairly small town, it gives us an, a good overview um, of, the, of the process. Okay. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you.